Hello and welcome back to day three of this special week-long virtual edition of Crew Connect Global. Hopefully many of you have been able to watch and take part in the sessions and discussions we've had already this week, but if you haven't, please go and check the agenda pages of the event platform where you can catch all the sessions on demand. Today we're focusing on the Philippines, a virtual hub of crew expertise for our global industry, so to help us unpack the latest opportunities and points of learning, we're delighted to be joined by three fantastic speakers. Gerardo Borromeo, CEO of PTC Group, Vice President of the Philippines Ship Owners Association and Vice Chair of ICS, will be joined by two government representatives, the Under Secretary of the Department of Finance, Jill Beltran, and Administrator for the Maritime Industry Authority, Vice Admiral Robert Empedrad. Robert and Gerardo will be joining me later on this morning to answer some of your questions. So please do use the Q&A and chat functions on the right hand side of your screen to send your questions in and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Don't forget you can also use this platform to find and connect with other attendees. So please do take a look and virtually network as best you can. Finally, I want to say a big thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters. You can find all of their company profiles in the platform, learn more about their excellent service propositions and connect directly with their teams. So that's enough from me. It gives me great pleasure to hand you over to Gerardo Boromir. Good morning and good afternoon to our Crew Connect audience. A warm hello from the Philippines. With us today is a member of the Philippine government to share a perspective on the country's economic outlook some 20 months after this global pandemic turned the world upside down. Our speaker has had an illustrious career in the civil service and is today the chief economist of the Department of Finance, where he is undersecretary. Without a doubt, this pandemic has had a significant impact globally and certainly locally. But hope springs eternal, particularly from this side of the ocean, home to over 400,000 of the world's global maritime professions. We look forward to listening to his remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor then to introduce our keynote speaker, Undersecretary Hill Beltran of the Philippine Department of Finance. On behalf of Philippine Finance Secretary Carlos G. Dominguez, allow me to congratulate the organizers of the Crew Connect Global Conference in Forma Maritime Events for putting up such an important event. In my career with the Philippine Finance Department, spanning over four decades, events like this serve as platforms to exchange ideas, share experiences, discuss issues with stakeholders, and start and sustain the ball rolling for game-changing reforms. Just two weeks ago, our national income accounts were released, and we were pleasantly surprised that our economy grew by 7.1% in the third quarter of the year, significantly higher than the median private sector outlook of 4.7%. Quarter on quarter, the economy grew at a respectable rate of 3.8%, reversing the 1.4% decline in the prior quarter. That the economy grew much more than expected despite their imposition of stricter quarantine measures suggests that the Philippines is already learning how to live with the virus. We are already essentially shifting away from a risk avoidance stance a risk management posture. For one, our quarantine measures are already much more localized and granular as compared to the blanket lockdown we imposed last year. Also, the arrival of much needed vaccines is providing us individual protection to the population, which is paving the way for the gradual reopening of the economy. Our bout with the virus is in many ways like our running the gauntlet with the various crises that the Philippines underwent. My experience in the first three decades of public services was like jumping from one frying pan to another. Fiscal crisis in the early 1980s 
followed by a political upheaval, power crisis and the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the early 1990s, followed by the Asian financial crisis, the fiscal distress in the early 2000s, followed by the global financial crisis, or GFC. But we were able to escape from the GFC relatively unscathed, sprightly recover from it, and roared our way to growth of above 6% until COVID-19 spoiled the party. But economic managers were not totally unprepared for that ongoing health crisis. We have come a long way until before the crisis. In the late 1980s, we implemented fiscal reforms and privatized many inefficient government corporations in the 1990s. Essentially, government backtracked on being an athlete in the economy. Instead, government would play the role of a disinterested referee, provider of a level playing field, promoter of competition, one that maintains macroeconomic stability, a partner for infrastructure development, and a champion for inclusive development. More recently, the administration of President Duterte also introduced packages of tax reforms to bankroll infrastructure development and social services, such as education and universal health care. What distinguishes these recent fiscal reforms from previous reforms is that for us in the latter, we're meant to address crisis or avert impending crisis. The former focuses on equity and efficiency issues, that is, to make the economy more competitive and inclusive. In other words, it's not all about raising cash, unlike in the previous decades where macroeconomic instability was the clear and present danger. It's also about cutting red tape, clearing uncertainties in the tax law, and being more strategic in the granting of fiscal incentives in our quest for inclusive and sustainable resource mobilization. No sooner did we address taxation issues surrounding real estate investment trusts than the first applicant filed for an initial public offering, or IPO. Currently, there are five REITs in the local boards already, all of them listing in the stock exchange during the pandemic. When the pandemic struck, we were already busy with our ambitious infrastructure program and established conditional cash transfer program for the poor and universal health care program, partly financed, of course, by our tax reforms. Plus, we have the fiscal space with which to help affected individuals partially recover lost incomes through unconditional cash transfers. With the necessary programs and reforms in place, we did not really have to go back to the drawing board to drastically overhaul our plans for recovery. Pandemic or not, we need to spend on infrastructure development and social services, continue with our drive for digitalization, but for more liberalization, and promote more competition. It is also a tautological fact that being subject to competition enhances competitiveness. For that, we made steps to liberalize the economy. For instance, we have already opened banking and power generation to 100% foreign ownership. The amendments to the Commonwealth Era Public Service Act, Foreign Investments Act, and the Retail Trade Liberalization Act are in advanced stages of the legislative process. Maintaining and enhancing competitiveness is an important ingredient if we are to survive in a very dynamic economy. Allow me to make a commentary on this against the historical backdrop of our development story and touch on, even if tangentially, the possible implications on the maritime sector. We have already put behind us macroeconomic stability issues. With it, we have increased our focus on efficiency and equity concerns and started looking at the bigger picture of resource mobilization rather than narrowly on revenue production. When we privatized many government corporations, we wanted greater mobilization of private sector resources. It is not, however, enough for government to simply let go of the operations for the private sector to take on. We need to have an enabling environment for it. Allow me to cite a specific example of expanding the opportunity set 
of gaining access to formal sources of financing by small and medium-sized enterprises, or what we call SMEs. Creating an environment for alternative sources of financing rests on three pillars. One, first, is policy and regulations. Second, is financial infrastructure. And third, consumer education and protection. The Department of Finance worked with various stakeholders for the passage of the Personal Property Security Act. The law was signed in 2018 and provides for the creation, perfection, determination of priority, establishment of a centralized notice registry, and enforcement of security interests in personal property and for other purposes. Said law does not cover ocean-going vessels and aircrafts, but it's a good start nevertheless for making antiquated laws more up-to-date relevant and useful for our developmental objectives. A companion bill to the PPSA is the Warehouse Receipts Bill, aimed at reforming the Warehouse Receipts Law of 1912 so as to be more responsive to the needs of the time. If passed, this will have paved the way for the professionalization of the uh, warehousing sector in the country. The bill hurdled scrutiny in the House of Representatives, but is yet to pass that of the Senate. We recognize that our people are our best assets. For that, we have been increasing our budget for social services, namely health, social protection, and education. A few years back, we even passed a law that provides underprivileged Filipino students the opportunity to pursue college degrees through free tuition and exemption from other fees in state universities and colleges. We are also strengthening the civil service. We have, for instance, recently established the Philippine Tax Academy, and we hope to have it fully operational next year. The Academy will help mold and train revenue collectors, not merely into capable and efficient tax collection personnel, but above all, fiscal administrators with high level of professional commitment and ethical standards. The establishment of the economy is very timely given the passage of the Customs Modernization and Tariff Act. The CMTA radically changed the strategic and operational focus of the Bureau of Customs from revenue collection to border protection and trade facilitation. Professionalization is an indispensable ingredient in maintaining and enhancing competitiveness both in the public and private sectors. We need to raise the bar if we are to step up in the value chain. A generation or two ago, Many Filipinos worked abroad as domestic helpers with which they sent their children to school, who in turn became nurses, engineers, accountants, and yes, among others, seafarers. Those that set out to sea might have begun their careers in ocean-going vessels as able-bodied seafarers, but some have set their eyes on becoming able-skilled seafarers. Filipino seafarers have been proving their worth in the open seas not only in terms of brawn, but more importantly, in terms of brain. We should support such noble aspirations of our capable seafarers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Undersecretary Beltran for sharing his thoughts on the Philippine economy today, where we stand, and what's ahead in 2022 and beyond. Joining me this afternoon, is Vice Admiral Robert M. Pedrad, a distinguished naval officer who served as flag officer in command of the Philippine Navy and who is today the administrator of our Maritime Industry Authority, Marina, our flag state administration. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank uh, you. It's my pleasure, sir. We've just heard from uh, Undersecretary Beljan about the fairly rosy outlook on the Philippine economy. And, and from Marina's perspective, how does that play out in terms of your own strategic plans? Um, I, I, th I think that's a great question. And if, if you look at the Maritime Industry Authority uh, strategic plan, we have, we have crafted uh, the Maritime Industry Development Plan. It's a 10-year plan. Uh, and, and this was uh, published in 2018. However, is still being studied by NEDA. It should be approved by the president so that we can get the funds to uh, move forward in the development of our maritime industry development plan. 
Uh, but as of this uh, moment, it's still with NEDA. But I think the bright side will always be our seafarers because we are still the number one uh, producing seafarer in the world. Yes. And in spite of the pandemic, um, if, if you look at our uh, deployment of our seafarers in 20, uh, 20 where the pandemic is very, uh, it's just uh, came about, uh, we deployed around half, 50% of what we used to do mm -hmm. to, to deploy. Uh, but if you look at the remittance of our seafarers uh, in 2019, uh, we, they remitted 6.5 billion. Mm -hmm. In 2020, 6.3 billion is just a shortage of 200 million, uh, because even though the the cruise line were sh were not operating, our seafarers are still there, and, and what we did is to extend their certificate so that they continue to be uh, yeah. working with the cruise line. I mean, our Filipino seafarers. So, so even if we've lost about 20 months, you feel that the Philippines can can still continue to be a seafaring capital of the world. Yes, sir. Uh, we are still the number one. I think the, based on our report, the the Philippine uh, the the ship owners uh, once is still the the Filipino seafarers to be employed by them. You know, we uh, for many years the the Philippines has played an important role, uh, and we've been lucky to have uh, the quality people who have been able to find that kind of a job uh, overseas. But let's look ahead. Uh, what, from your perspective, having been a Navy man yourself and, and been involved as a mariner for many, many years, how difficult will it be for us to find the next generation of Filipino who wants to go to sea? Yeah, uh, we, we have to um, make some adjustments in the, the way we uh, train our uh, future seafarers because we are, they are, what we are doing in the country is uh, they have to go through a four-year baccalaureate course that includes the OBP. Um, but what we are planning to do now with Marina is we remove the OBT from the Mechi. The right? onboard training. The onboard, onboard training. training. But yeah. what you're saying is that you mm. will complete the academic requirements, yeah. allow the individual to graduate with a degree, yes. but they still have to complete the onboard training yes. at some point in time in order to get their license. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, if we just parallel this to the Philippine Military Academy. Then I chose to join the Philippine Navy. Then the Philippine Navy tr trained me to be um, a qualified Navy officer. That's the only time you got marinized. What you're saying <laughs> is that during the formal academic period, you will concentrate on the academics. Yes. But how will you be able to uh, introduce potential mariners to what life at sea is like, or how do you yeah. get them even semi-marinized? What, what do you have in mind? That's a good question, sir. Uh, the OBT will be replaced by um, uh, simulators and practical exercises related mm -hmm. to, uh, to maritime. So, mm -hmm. uh, they so they'll will, have a glimpse. They'll have yes, a glimpse of yes, what it's like. Yeah. So that uh, when they graduate and they will go aboard ship, uh, the principal owners or the ship's owner will be uh, we'll, we'll see the difference that these mm -hmm. uh, graduates will be better than the, the previous one. And when does this program, when do you envision this program to, to take effect? Uh, we are coming up with a new curriculum with uh, SHED. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will implement the first year program, the first year level. The second year level will be in 2023 and 2024. And then um, and the third year level, and then the fourth year level, probably in 24 to 25. Uh, if, if this will be, um, if this will materialize, then we have a new curriculum. Um, the 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 MHAI will graduate students, and then when they graduate, they have those who wants to be officers aboard ship, they have to undergo OBT. That will be managed by Mar Mar Maritime Industry Authority mm -hmm. uh, before we give the licenses, and they will be sent. And they become seafarers. Undersecretary Beltran talked about mm -hmm. the need to develop able skilled yeah. seafarers or maritime professionals. How right. difficult do you think it will be for us to create the, the able skilled individual as opposed to the able bodied individual of before? Well, I don't think it's difficult, sir, because we have um, um, competent maritime training institution to do that. When they graduate, the uh, marina will, will uh, focus on the competence of our seafarers, then we will deal with the maritime training institution. That's where we will focus. And I think there's no, 
we don't have to reinvent the wheel because we have we have good maritime training institution that can uh, help Marina mm -hmm. to develop competency fairs. And this recalibration, if you will, of the academic yeah. program, yes. how does that fit into the overall STCW uh, convention? Yeah, we are still compliant to STCW convention because uh, what makes us involved in the baccalaureate degree is the OBT. So when you remove the OBT from the uh, baccalaureate degree, um, then Marina can focus on, on, on the seafarers because they will become only seafarers when they are given the licenses. So Marina will be deeply involved in the conduct of OBT. So what we're really saying is that the academic institutions will concentrate on developing and delivering an academic program. Yes. You will take out the requirement of onboard training from the educational institutions, yeah. but it remains a requirement in yes. order to get the license. Yes. And that 12 month period, or in some cases, it might even be 18 months. That is where Marina will focus to ensure that okay. your the yeah. output, if you yeah. will, the outcome of academic in, uh, education yeah. can really be shown and yeah. demonstrated. And, and we are um, confident that we produce a better and competent uh, Filipino seafarers. Well, I'm sure that that will be an interesting topic that will yeah. be taken up in various fora and maybe in the question and answer period later. Yeah. I'm sure some people would like to to uh, maybe probe a little bit more about that. Yeah. But but how about the student themselves? How What can Marina do or is it in Marina's plan anywhere to see how you attract the best and brightest because of the next generation of Filipinos. Because after all, many industries are looking for good talent. Yeah. And so the maritime industry itself will be, will be hard pressed, I think, to find the kind of people who would like to go to sea. Is there any program, is there anything that you're doing to try to attract these next generation of individuals? Yeah, I think Filipino loves to go to sea because we are a maritime nation and our maritime heritage says that um, Filipino wants to go to sea. That's why if you look at our uh, uh, students, it, the number of uh, joining the maritime higher education, it's, it's, it's big. It's a big amount, uh, a big number, 25,000 mm -hmm. uh, wants to be uh, seafarers. But I think um, we don't have to, uh, to ask them to join the, uh, the maritime, uh, the seafaring mm -hmm. industry because um, it's in our blood. We love the, the sea. I think the people love, the Filipino people love to go to sea. One of the challenges I think we see uh, overall is that oftentimes the general public or, or maybe even government, uh, yeah. certainly not Marina, but other sectors of the government don't really fully understand the, the way the shipping industry and its yeah. nuances. Yeah. Uh, what has Marina planned in its, in its uh, strategic view on, on how to get the local environment more attuned to the importance of the maritime industry? Yeah, you know, sir, uh, we are a maritime nation. We have 7,600 islands. And um, some of these islands cannot be uh, reached by land or by air because there are no airports uh, in all our islands. And I, I believe that um, the future of our country is to develop our maritime industry for the, the, for the progress and econo econo economic progress of our country. Mm -hmm. When... when um, uh, goods are moving from one island to the other in a quick as possible way by ships and by putting up ports, then I think it will be good for the economy and, and for our country because uh, goods uh, will reach the, the remotest place of our country. I think we have to develop our uh, infrastructure, the efficiency of our ports. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to develop our infrastructure. A more comprehensive plan. Yes. And is this part of your 10-year? Marina yeah, has yes. a 10-year strategic plan. Yes, sir. Uh, the 10-year strategic uh, development plan um, has nine priority projects, uh, programs. So uh, that includes the shipping industry, the flag registry, our, um, our seafaring industry, mm -hmm. the shipbuilding industry is also involved here. Sure, sure. Yes. But you know, the, the contribution of the maritime industry, I think there was an economic study that back in 2015, the maritime industry contributed about 6% of, of GDP in the Philippines. Yes, yes. And, and some economists think that uh, this could be double or even triple that amount if the whole integration of everything that you talk about uh, yes. come into being. Right. And, and what else do you think is necessary in order to ensure that this kind of a plan can actually come to fruition? So hopefully more representation of the maritime industry can come back. We are coming up with our, our national elections in 2022. Yes, yes, sir. And yes. hopefully you will get the, the kind of uh, representation from the sectoral side that will help you uh, yes. in, in moving this program forward. Sure enough, forward. Sir. Yeah. 
Well, let me go back to this, uh, this talk of education because uh, our, our audience here at Crew Connect, uh, a lot of them are, are very, very keen on, on the development of a Filipino maritime professional. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the biggest challenges that uh, the Philippines has faced, or, or maybe uh, what I would call uh, a, a, a shadow, has mm -hmm. been the concern of EMSA over the past years. And yeah. interestingly enough, when, when you came on board, uh, <laughs> Two things were happening. Yes. Uh, you came on board just, uh, this was in uh, March, March of, of last year, of 2020. Mm -hmm. EMSA was in the Philippines at that time finishing their audit. Yeah. And that weekend passed. And on Tuesday, the, the, the government shut down the whole country. Yes. So you've been uh, administrator of Marina for 570 or so days. Yes, 19 months, sir. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and tell us, uh, how has it been? And, and how is it in terms of dealing with this uh, EMSA issue? Yeah, it's really very tough, sir, because uh, when I assume, as, I, as you said, um, uh, it's the, the president declares um, a quarantine for the entire country. Mm -hmm. And our our employees has to stay home. And then how can you lead if your employees is not with you? Um, that's a uh, very challenging uh, as far as uh, the administrator is concerned. But as far as MSI is concerned, the thing, sir, is um, MSI started to inspect us in, in 2006. And then they came over to see our compliances to their findings several other times mm -hmm. until 2018, I think eight times. And then in 2010, 2020, they went back uh, just to verify our compliance. Um, and, and maybe they will decide uh, after that audit. But they found out that uh, there are more findings that were seen by the audit team before. Mm -hmm. This is now um, the uh, um, a strategic action plan that I'm going to do over a period of 19 months, as you said. Um, and one problem is that um, the, the marina did not involve our stakeholders in addressing the findings. In the past. In the past. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not trying to blame anyone else. Um, but um, the stakeholders are asking marina to involve, to let them be involved in, the, in addressing the measures. Uh, so, so twice we opened the findings to our stakeholders. They were involved in two workshops to address the findings. And then we subjected our corrective action. It's a strategic corrective action to them mm -hmm. uh, to tell us if they are satisfied and if there is something that would, they would add to the yes. uh, findings. Uh, and, and so we integrated all these uh, comments and the advice and the inputs of our mm -hmm. stakeholders. Now, we will be coming up with a, a primer, a strategic action plan. Yes. A comprehensive one, which has never been done before. Uh, and this is the product of not only the marina, but the entire industry of the country. So, um, But the, the update on the EMSA is the, we have yet to receive the, the assessment report of the European Committee. So the Europe, European Committee, regardless of uh, we we substantially address the findings or not, will issue a negative report, which is withdrawal. Oh, they will issue a negative. You yes. feel that they will issue a negative report? They will, they will. Because okay. they, did not, they did not require Marina to submit our corrective action. Okay. So they will decide without the corrective action of the Maritime Industry Authority. Then they will give us two months to submit our uh, action plan or corrective action mm -hmm. plan. And then eventually the final decision will be made by the saf safety of sea of uh, Euro the, the European countries. And, and, and they will decide based on if we were able to address the findings based on our strategic action plan. And where are you in terms of, of putting together the, the, the comprehensive uh, re response to, to this audit? Yeah, based on, based on um, our assessment and the assessment of our stakeholders, I think they are happy in what we have done. I think we believe that the safety of sea will eventually um, uh, um, um, decide in favor of the Filipino so, so you're unfaced. You're unfaced with the challenge. I mean, and the, and the, and yeah. and the possibility that mm. we will get a negative uh, uh, yes, response. Yes, yeah. I, I believe uh, uh, with all my heart and very confident that we will, uh, the, the safety of sea will overturn whatever decision the EC will uh, 
Well, you know, uh, when you talk of stakeholders, I mean, we do have the, the local stakeholders, but we have very much our foreign partners, uh, the yes. Japanese and Norwegians, right, the Greeks, right. the, the Dutch, uh, yeah. uh, all of the different countries. And how have they been able or how, what kind of dialogue have you had with them in terms mm -hmm. of addressing these particular concerns? Because I believe for the most part, um, yeah. the anecdotal evidence is that Filipinos uh, are very good seafarers, are yeah. good maritime professionals and are still in demand. Yeah. Uh, but yet, because we uh, operate in an ISO environment, then it's very clear that, that all of these, this, this documentary evidence needs to be put in place. Yeah. But so how, how has it been in terms of dealing and discussing with our, with our partners, our, our international partners, particularly from Europe? We have someone in uh, Norway, uh, Per Arns, I know you, you know Per Arns. We, um, we hire him as our advisor. So he continuously give us uh, advice on how to deal with EMSA. Mm -hmm. He's uh, an expert uh, by his own right. And um, we, we continue to engage the IMO. Whatever we are doing as far as the EMSA is concerned, we involve the IMO. In mm -hmm. fact, in the past um, in the past six months, uh, because one of the findings is uh, our audit personnel are not capable, are yes. not capacitated. So we requested IMO, experts from IMO, to do training to our audit team. So the, the IMO already have done two training. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the on the assessment and and on the the, the entire um, uh, the maritime industry aspect and then so we did that already and mm -hmm. in in this month uh, the IMO will be coming back to to train the trainers they are they are saying train the trainers yes. on the on the curriculum development so we are we are involving the IMO and our um, and we keep on and we also involve ourselves with uh, our counterparts mm -hmm. in the maritime industry, for example, in Singapore, Indonesia, uh, we, I've, I've involved, I have been meeting with them as also as yeah. far as vaccination of seafarers and, uh, and other engagement that involves our compliance to mm -hmm. the STCW convention. Yeah. And when you think about all of that, the responsibility you have as administrator to ensure that the compliance, the studies and, and the responses are given, you feel that we will ultimately still be able to, to retain the, a, a positive response. Yes, sir. I, I believe the safety of sea will overturn the decision of the East. And, and why is that? What, what is it that you think, uh, what, what will be the, the overriding reason why they may overturn a possible negative finding? Um, because of uh, that, we, how we comprehensively uh, address mm -hmm. the findings. Mm -hmm. um, we created the task group and look into the root cause analysis. This was never done before. Uh, and, and look at systems and procedures and quality measure, quality procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we look into the, the aspect of uh, even beyond EMSA, even beyond EMSA. I think mm -hmm. our, we will submit a report that, e e that is even beyond what EMSA is requiring us to do. But beyond, beyond the report, I mean, ultimately what the auditors are looking for is the implementation, yes. the effective implementation across. Yes. How can you assure that uh, from Marina's perspective and how can you assure that, say, as the administrator, that in fact, uh, what we say we will do, we will be able to do? Um, yes, indeed, sir, because uh, the, the report will also include our um, um, factual evidence. Mm -hmm. if, if this has been implemented. So after, say, almost 14 years of a very challenging yes. discussion with EMSA, in the last 19 months, you feel you have been able to take the bull by the horns yes. and now can come up with a comprehensive response which will satisfy EMSA. Yes, uh, very confidently. Uh, there has never been a um, report in the past, a comprehensive report that will address EMSA. It's only now that we are coming up with a primer. Mm -hmm. And um, and in more importantly, the all the stakeholders are involved. It's not just Marina, it's everyone's uh, effort. Well, you know, this yeah. is going to be a continuing effort. This is not a yes. one-off. And in yeah. fact, perhaps it's good that, that you have a set of a extra set of eyes and ears from outside. Yeah, because sure, at sure. the end of the day, what is core and what is key to the maritime industry is safety. Yes. And, and ensuring safety. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be good. And I guess mm -hmm. time will tell, but we, we were, we're very hopeful that you are able to deliver on this because I guess the entire maritime industry is, is resting its future on, uh, on the Philippine government's ability to comply. 
Oh, yes, sir. Um, I'm very happy that um, uh, what we did in the past 19 months is we always, we regularly uh, do a, a we, we regularly took, talked with our stakeholders mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Um, uh, not only in the shipbuilding, but even the domestic ship, um, the LMAs, the, the seafarers themselves, the schools, the training institution, we re regularly meet with them. So that um, and, and to get their inputs on how we move forward, because they, these are the experts, yeah. and this has not been done before. You know, it's um, interesting. You talk about the domestic shipping industry. Yeah, how sure. can you get the domestic ship owners and the domestic shipping industry to support everything that you're doing in order to be able to create a good, strong platform for the future development, not only of uh, shipping operations, but really more importantly, our maritime professionals. Yes, sir. We are currently studying the uh, OBT aboard our domestic ships. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll be coming up with um, a, a mar marina circular on this one, mm -hmm. and we involve them in crafting the the OBT MC. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have, have to enhance our MC that we we will be we will ensure that uh, when the cadets are aboard our domestic ships. Uh, they will be trained based on the STC content, STCW content, based on the MC that we are coming up. One of the things that uh, will be very important is the ability to continue to carry yeah. on and follow through. Right. Uh, we're coming up with uh, our national elections in 2022. What can Marina do to sort of institutionalize a lot of the changes that you feel are very important so that as the administration changes uh, in 2022 and beyond that we can still keep many of the good things that you've yeah. been able to uh, get started so far? Yeah, that's a great question, sir. Uh, first, uh, the MIDP is here. Uh, I, I would like it to be approved by the president. The MIDP is, is the... It the Maritime Industry Development Plan. Yes. Uh, this is a 10-year plan. Yes. If this is approved by the president, then there is an institution that we will just follow. And uh, internally in Mani, Mani, Marina, uh, we are coming up with uh, a PG, uh, the Philippine uh, the per, per performance governance system, just like what we did in the Philippine Navy, mm -hmm. to institutionalize all the things that we'll be doing, so that whenever whenever the administrator is replaced, he will just uh, do what is stated or what is placed in in the, the voyage plan of the Philippine of the of the, Mar, of the Marina, a voyage plan which is linked with the MIDP. So that um, it, it, when I step down, the person that will replace me will just uh, uh, execute what is in the voyage plan in the in, in the MIDP. When we think about you know all of these particular plans, uh, one one of the things that 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 strikes me is our ability to to carry forward within the organization of Marina. What are you doing to try to attract? Uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of talent that is necessary to in order to allow Marina to, to be an effective uh, organization, not only locally, but internationally because of all of the changing governance rules. Yeah, um, it's very challenging because the maritime industry has grown so much and the maritime industry authority remains as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no additional personnel. Is that part of your MIDP to be able to grow Marina or to no, enhance? No, sir. Um, I, I have a 10-point agenda as the administrator. One is to um, strengthen our organizational structure and the capacity of our personnel. Uh, we had uh, we just um, uh, we had a study with the Development Academy of the Philippines to uh, transform our organizational structure. Structure. This has already been approved by the, 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 the Department of Budget and Management, increasing our personnel fill up from 800 to 2,200, that's our, in additional 1,500. And, um, and, and, and the intent of this is to um, strengthen our uh, regional office mm -hmm. so that they do the, the regulatory function and the development of our industry. Um, not what we are doing today that everyone is going to the central office you know and, and the, you've, the, decentralized. you've decentralized you've decentralized a lot of decentralized, the functions decentralized yeah. uh, so we have to increase the manpower personnel of our mro mm -hmm. and capacitate them um, and then uh, to capacitate our personnel you um, uh, we did some um, memorandum of uh, agreement with uh, wmu Mm -hmm. that offers a masteral degree uh, for uh, maritime and, um, and then we'll continue to train our personnel. We hire, we train, 
incapacitate ourselves. With with all plans, all good plans, yes, something could possibly go wrong and still go wrong. Yeah. Have you thought about how to try to overcome continuing challenges and 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 what could possibly go wrong with uh, trying to get the whole um, MIDP, the 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 ten year plan, uh, uh, going uh, effectively? Uh, first, uh, the quality procedure should be in place, um, and then instill it uh, in our personnel. Uh, that uh, internal they will be they should internalize the quality procedures uh, and put some uh, pride uh, in themselves when you took office you you actually uh, uh, faced the marina staff and you 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 challenged them to to, yeah. to improve performance and yeah. ensure that all yeah. of the the negative press could uh, yeah. could uh, go, could go away how, how bad was the situation when you took over and where do you see it now 19 months later our brand of service is selfless mm -hmm. and um, but, but I, I I don't know if you are a religious person but uh, I always uh, caught uh, a verse from verse from the Bible whenever yes. I talk to them uh, to encourage them to do the right thing, uh, to instill the, with them the discipline and professionalism uh, in doing mm -hmm. their job. And I think uh, they're listening to me, they're following my lead, and I'm very happy. Well, well congratulations, Administrator. I think that's yeah. really good to be able to try to instill discipline. Um, and you know, with an ever-changing situation, yeah. it's always difficult. So, yes. so if you can get into the heart and soul of people yeah. and, and give them that kind of... Uh, mindset uh, to be service oriented that's really what what we all are looking for yeah. uh, but let's look about let's let's talk about uh, this mindset and and let's talk about service because the last 19 months of your tenure you were faced with a tremendous problem the the crew change crisis yeah, uh, how how did you see that all evolve uh, what were some of the challenges you faced and how did you finally try to get ahead of it? I mean, and I know even today we're still yeah. facing uh, the, the 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 major crisis because mm -hmm. the pandemic is, is is still around us. When Secretary Tugade uh, met with the IMO, there was a meeting before with the IMO Secretary Kita Klim uh, in in one uh, uh, engagement. He mentioned that the, the the opening up of our ports for uh, crew chains makes our country an international uh, port for crew chains, international mm -hmm. hub for crew chains. And he even mentioned to the Secretary uh, General that uh, the ports will stay. It's even in a post-pandemic uh, yes. uh, situation, the ports will remain to be a crew chains ports uh, for uh, for all uh, seafarers or uh, ships that want to do crew chains. So, that, so we open up our, our ports. And that's a good uh, move as far as our, our country is concerned. But with the ever-changing uh, protocol of uh, the pandemic, um, like for example, um, what is happening is that the, 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 uh, our seafarers from Netherlands cannot come home because of the uh, protocols that are put in oh, place. Oh, the red listing. Yeah, right, yeah, the red yeah. listing. I, I think there is an, a, a, you know, a, a venue wherein uh, we can open up to our um, uh, to our secretary of the Department of Transportation because he's the one in charge with the uh, uh, crew chains of the Filipino seafarers, the deployment and employment, and, and then uh, and then he can open this up to the IATF so that um, uh, whenever we come up with protocols, uh, they will exempt our seafarers from the ever changing protocol because yes. uh, if you do not exempt our seafarers then it's very expensive to maintain seafarers because uh, the ship owners are complaining they cannot bring down our seafarers because they will stay in a hotel and very expensive uh, yeah. to manage them. So I, I think uh, to um, be able to maintain our being number one, um, a seafaring producing country, we have to be more strategic in coming up with protocols to exempt our and then maybe seafarers. once these protocols are established to try to build some consistency in yes. their applications mm -hmm. even as the environmental situation changes yeah. and and hopefully you can continue to carry the flag for yeah. not only the philippine industry but really the whole global industry who is reliant yes. on filipinos is yes. really in need of ensuring that the continuous 
facilitated movement of Filipinos, uh, Filipino seafarers can take place. You're right. You're right, sir. Uh, so uh, it's just a matter of um, um, telling or rem reminding our um, 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 the IATF that uh, when we come up with uh, uh, instilling them the need to exempt our uh, Filipino seafarers. Uh, with these ever-changing protocols. Yeah. I, I know it's difficult, but I hope that you can continue to carry that yeah, uh, yeah. that message yeah. because if there's anything, you know, you talk about stakeholders and I believe we are all in one yeah. that the during this pandemic, what really allowed the global economy to continue yeah. to evolve was really the fact that the shipping industry continued to operate. Yeah. And if it weren't for the sacrifice of, of of seafarers all over the world yes. uh, to continue to remain on duty and on board. Yeah. Uh, I think we would have had a more serious situation, economically yeah. speaking. So anything that Marina can do in this regard, would I've been sure would be yeah. would be uh, well appreciated. And I'm sure maybe in the question and answer period that will yeah. follow, some questions will probably be posed on that. And maybe you can continue to, to carry, as I said, the flag yeah. uh, for, yes, for the industry. And, and if I may add, sir, uh, when we open up our ports for crew chains, Lots of uh, um, uh, ships came over to the Philippines to do food chains, and that allows us to um, uh, to bring home our extended, overextended um, seafarers aboard uh, their ship to come home to their family. And when the ships are coming here, of course they will say, uh, "Why, why don't we look?" For other seafarers, when sure. you have the Filipino sure, seafarers, sure. so it, it, it helps. It yes, helps. yes, and and I think if I'm not mistaken, the, the your efforts in terms of creating these green lane protocols was also mm -hmm. helpful to foreign mm -hmm. seafarers. Yes, because yes. it allowed any maritime yes. professional yeah. to be able to move. We were the one to convince IATF to uh, give them the highest priority. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, so, so that's happened. But the LGU does not understand. So we came up with the T TWG to help in the vaccination of the seafarers and, and to strategically communicate to LGUs that, hey, you have mm -hmm. to prioritize our uh, uh, our seafarers. And that um, did wonders, the collaboration again, the collaboration between stakeholders and Marina. And in July, September, and now October, you talk about four months later, uh, we have still enough uh, vaccines, but we cannot find seafarers anymore to be vaccinated. Because? because I think they have mostly been vaccinated. Yeah, yes, and then and, and the reports of the LMAs to me. One LMA has reported to me that uh, they have vaccinated 98 percent of their seafarers, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't have the numbers because uh, when they are vaccinated by the LGUs, they don't uh, inform us. So, but based on our uh, data, when 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 we do vaccinate vaccination in Amosu, in um, various LGUs. Um, we have limited seafarers, and more more often than not, the vaccines that are allocated for that day for the seafarers are being uh, jabbed to the other essential workers yeah. of the maritime industry, mm -hmm. like the LMA employees, mm -hmm. the the shipbuilding, and the domestic ships. Well, it's yeah. it's 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 good that the vaccines are here. We now have yeah. a, a lot of uh, supply in the Philippines, yes. and we need to continue to push this. In fact, the government is now talking about booster shots. Yes. Uh, yes how about uh, foreign uh, uh, seafarers, foreign maritime professionals coming through? Would they be eligible to receive a vaccine uh, if requested? I think there is no reason why we cannot allow that sale. Um, but I, I'll 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 discuss this with the, the Department of Health. I, I think there's no problem. We have enough, uh, and, and telling them that ours. Our Filipino she seafarers are also vaccinated by uh, other, countries. other countries when they are yes. aboard their ships. Yes, yes. So, yes. So, yeah. so let me ask you uh, this, Administrator. Uh, what have you learned from the last 19 months when it comes to uh, these 99-year events, which are never really expected? Because, you know, you have to look at business continuity planning. I know, know, you, I know you have a 10-year uh, uh, strategic plan. Uh, have you built into that uh, business continuity so that if ever a 99-year event happens again, yeah, right. we will be better prepared? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Um... You know, I realized when I assumed as the administrator after 19 months or even a year earlier, I realized the importance of the maritime industry in the progress of our country, the future of our country. And um, I, I think uh, we failed to um, uh, maybe uh, educate or tell our um, leadership, our, our, you know, our political leaders, how important the maritime industry in the progress of our country. 
There is no progressive, you can find any progressive country that has weak maritime industry. I believe uh, with all my heart that if we have a progressive uh, maritime industry, it will make our country very progressive. So let me go back to that 10-year strategic plan. Yes, yes. Where in there uh, are the elements to allow for a more progressive uh, maritime industry and, and a, 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 a vision which you can say the blue economy, the blue Philippines? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. There are nine priority programs of the MIDP and it um, pertains some studies on how to develop the trade how to modernize our shipbuilding capability, how to make our domestic ships more competitive, how to make our um, seafarers more competitive. Uh, there are programs in each of the priority programs. There are nine mm -hmm. in each of the priority program. And there has to be a budget to uh, for the continuing uh, study mm -hmm. uh, as stipulated in the MIDB for us to move forward. Uh, and I believe um, this is a, the MIDP is a product of the whole maritime industry. Um, even the other government uh, sectors were involved in the crafting of the MIDP. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if we just execute what is stipulated in the MIDP, uh, I think uh, there is no reason for us not to progress in our industry. Do you, do you think that in the remaining term of uh, uh, President Duterte that you will be able to get the 10-year plan approved? Yes, yes, I, I will do this. And you have the support of, of the Department of Transportation for this? Yes, uh, actually, sir, uh, the, the, the Secretary has uh, um, supported the Maritime Industry Development mm -hmm. Plan. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's being studied by NEDA before it will be approved by the President. And we are following that up with Marina. And hopefully, uh, before the end of the President, that is that's, that's already been up. Okay. Well, that's, that will also be very, very good. Yeah. Um, do you have any message for our audience today? Uh, there are various stakeholders here. And, 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 and what kind of a message would you like to share with them, given the fact that, on the one hand, the anecdotal evidence uh, of, of the quality of maritime professionals from the Philippines is very high? Yeah. Uh, but the, of course, the environment has always proven to be challenging. You talk about the EMSA issue, yeah. you talk about bottlenecks in, in the way the system uh, has been set up, but you have done a lot and you've done wonders to be able to try to streamline all of that. And, yeah. and, and all under a time when um, not everybody was at the office. I mean, it was a lot of it was work yeah, right. from a remote location. So, so what, what message would you like to share uh, with our audience today to, to continue to encourage them uh, to look at the Philippines as a seafaring capital, yeah. to look at the Filipinos as the seafarer of choice, uh, notwithstanding these challenges, um, Administrator, yeah. please. Uh, uh, there is a report from BIMCO that says uh, they need, uh, we will be lacking 30,000 30, something officers, officers um, in, in the future. Um, but uh, the Filipino seafarers are here. They are competent and they are uh, well prepared. They are ready to go back to the sea. And uh, if you lack um, seafarers, you come here to the Philippines and we'll provide you with good and uh, quality, capable, competent Filipino seafarers, uh, which we always, um, uh, we were always number one uh, on that aspect. But and how about Marina? How else can Marina present itself to, to, to say that you're open, not only open for business, but you are there to try to facilitate the way business is carried out and will be carried out. Yeah, yes, sir. It's important that we change some laws to make our um, industry uh, moving forward. And uh, the other one is we will continue to engage and collaborate with our stakeholders. Uh, we will continue to meet with them regularly and maybe ask them what should be done for our industry to move forward. I, I think that's the one of the uh, salient mm -hmm. uh, features of my administration is when we get some insight and experts opinion, expert um, uh, advice from our stakeholders. But you act on it. Yes, we, and then we act on it. Mm -hmm. And then the next time that we meet again with them regularly, they even follow up what we have done. And, and do, you, do, you, do you welcome um, visitors from other countries to come and exchange notes with you? Yes, sir. Yes. Sure, sure. Yeah. 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 I, I will be going to uh, London for our candidature. Yes. Um, uh, in December, and I'll be meeting with my counterparts. Yeah, maybe that's a good uh, opportunity yeah. for you to reinforce, yes, um, especially all the work that you've done to, to address uh, the concerns raised by EMSA, because yeah. at the end of the day, that is perhaps the most pressing 
okay. of, of, of the challenges. Yes, I, sorry if I may add, uh, I would like to assure our uh, audience here that uh, when we submit our strategic action with EMSA, uh, we will, we will uh, get a favorable response. And, and we will continue not only to address the finding of EMSA, to raise the standards of what we are doing to be uh, compliant always to the SDCW Convention. Before we end, um, Administrator, let me just go back to something that uh, Undersecretary Beltran talked about, which is uh, before the Philippines entered this pandemic, it was lucky enough that its balance sheet was strong. Yes. It had sufficient cash, it had sufficient reserves. Uh, never before in, in our country's history have we had as high a level, which last month reached over $108 billion in, in reserves. So the, the, the position, the fiscal position coming in was, was good, which allowed them the leeway to stimulate uh, uh, the economy during the darkest moments of the last 20 months. But his message was, the government has done what it can. It's now up to the line agencies like Marina and the private sector to do what it can to be able to create yeah. uh, uh, the next the next wave of growth. Right. Uh, how would you like to address that uh, to our audience as well in, in terms of what we need to do and, and, to, and to, to make that a really strong rallying point? Uh, yes, uh, of course, um, we continue to be the number one producers of seafarers. And the other one is uh, how do we develop our domestic ships? Um, you know, there, there, are, there are so many things to be done, um, like um, improving the efficiency of uh, the turnover uh, of ships when they come here. How long can they um, up, up unload their uh, so cargo? The port infrastructure. Yeah, the port infrastructure and the connectivity to the land. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, and then the efficiency of the ports. Uh, we need to to connect our islands through ports and ships, making sure that uh, we have ships that will uh, um, uh, serve the routes that uh, we endeavor, uh, we, we thought to be important to our uh, um, uh, trade. Um, mm -hmm. And so if we connect our islands with ships and ports and the goods can travel quickly, uh, you know, I, I, I heard, I listened to one uh, interview of uh, uh, one maritime expert when he said that uh, what we're doing is we connect islands by building bridge and thinking that uh, when we transport the, the, the cargoes, the container vans through truck, it's, it's more very, it's more expensive than to deliver the uh, container vans through ships. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we connect um, we try to connect our islands through building uh, a bridge. The nautical highways. Yes, instead of um, building ports, make it efficient so that ships can use it uh, for uh, the speedy movement of our cargo that will help in our economy. So if we develop our uh, flag registry, if we develop, we increase our, our uh, those who will be um, uh, uh, Join and uh, enlist our uh, flag registry. You increase employment of our seafarers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You increase the profitability of our shipyards, um, and, and then the domestic, uh, the indirect costs when ships are here, all the requirements, the logistic requirements goes to our economy. Uh, so I think we just have to connect all the dots: um, the flag registry, the domestic ship, the shipbuilding, the transshipment. Uh, it's all there. It's all there. there. It's all in our uh, yeah. maritime industry. The, the, the maritime industry is definitely an, an industry that can enable so much. Yes. It, and and yeah. as we like to think, it, it moves the world. Yeah. And uh, we're also grateful to all of our maritime professionals, particularly Filipino maritime professionals, mm -hmm. for their sacrifice, their service, yes. which effectively moves the ships. And if you move the ships, you move the economy. If you move the economy, you are moving the world. So uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, yes, Administrator, sir. for joining me this afternoon. It's been a very, very interesting and insightful discussion. You've been very frank and 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 uh, uh, clear about the different challenges that you faced. Uh, you are meeting the EMSA issue head on. And as you have told me on uh, several of the discussion points that you are very confident that notwithstanding the challenges that we will ultimately get a favorable response. And, yeah. and I think having confidence is very, very important and projecting 
uh, this kind of confidence is also important to our audience. Um, the last 19 months have been very, very difficult. I mean, I, I could never have imagined that we would have lived through all of this. Uh, uh, knock on wood, we're still here, going strong. And, and thank you very much for your service. Thank you very much for all that you do. It's a, a thankless job in many respects, yes. and, and it's never over. I think everything that you've enumerated to me, <laughs> I'm just tired listening to uh, the, the yeah, fact yeah. that we still have to do this. And, and so I want to continue to encourage you mm. uh, to do what you can. And I'm sure that in the question and answer portion, there will be uh, several questions that we will try to address. Sure. I also want to thank uh, the Under Secretary Beltran for, for being with us this afternoon uh, and sharing his perspective on, on, on the Philippine economy. Thank you very much, yeah. Administrator. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much again to our global audience.